I'm Greg Zong. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Get yourself comfortable, sit on down. You're in the Manalist Cave, and this is Manalist TV. Here's what's going on in the baseball world, April 25th at noon Eastern. When I heard Jose Bautista turned down more money in Cleveland to sign a minor league deal in Atlanta, I said, sell crazy somewhere else. We're all stocked up here. I, for one, didn't believe he'd been offered a job, let alone multiple. After all, just a, over a year ago, all 30 teams passed on Jose Bautista for whatever reasons before the Jays finally circled back and gave him an $18 million mercy contract when they ultimately lost out on the Edwin sweepstakes. It almost seemed as if all 30 teams knew something about Bautista that we didn't. Now, after some more thoughtful reflection, I understand the signing of Bautista in Atlanta to play third base. I've said for several months now that his true value at this point is in the National League as a utility player, and now the fans will see the versatility of Jose's defensive game. We all know what he can do with a bat. Some may wonder, what would have motivated a guy like Jose Bautista to sign with a team that might lose 90 games this year when he has an offer from a playoff contender like Cleveland? Shouldn't the pursuit of a ring be the only thing on Jose's mind after all the money he's made? The moniker of World Series champion is the biggest void in his resume. One might question his motivation when he signs a minor league contract with a second tier team, but not me. You see, if he plays and he plays well, he has a chance to be traded to a contender at the deadline. Multiple contenders. Once traded, it's likely he's going to end up a role player on that contending team, so why limit himself to being a role player on one contender now? He could have a big year once he gets to Atlanta, and his friendship with GM Alex Anthopoulos can once again be leveraged. I guarantee that should the interest in Jose be high at the deadline, Alex and Jose would be working together to pick the best place for Jose that gives him the best chance to win. The Braves pulled off a coup in my mind. They can thank the relationship between Alex Anthopoulos and Bautista for it. They stand to get a whole lot better from the pre prospects a healthy and productive Jose can garner. By this time next year, this could look like the sweetest move the Braves have made, or just a meaningless blip. Either way, it didn't cost them anything. Brian Gumbel recently sat down with Derek Jeter, the owner of the Marlins, to discuss the state of the organization, and things got a little chippy. Two of the hallmarks of Jeter's career were his preparation and his grace under pressure. If you saw the interview, you probably didn't see either. He seemed to become bothered by Gumbel's repeated suggestion that the Marlins were tanking the season on purpose. As Gumbel described it, he put his feet to the fire over the trades of Miami's four best players in one offseason. Now, I can't help but think this was the first time that Jeter had really been pressed by a member of the media about something negative, and I found it odd that Jeter reacted the way that he did to the questions. After all, Jeter's career on the field was illustrious to say the least, and his career off the field even more impressive. All those years in the spotlight and never a hint of a scandal or misbehavior? That's a feat in itself. New York would have chewed me up and spat me out, and I know it. As I watched Gumbel's barrage, I found there were no definitively believable answers to any of his questions, and Jeter seemed to be deflecting when he jokingly called Gumbel mentally weak and suggested he was a potential target for him on the golf course. I'm not sure what Gumbel expected to hear from Jeter. He can't admit to the fan base that they aren't trying to win ball games, even though indirectly they aren't. They're not putting a competitive team on the field. We know it. It's obvious. The interview was awkward at best, and I was totally taken aback by a side of the Yankee great I've never seen before. I played against the guy for 16 years, and in all that time, I never saw him come unraveled. I wouldn't call what I saw a meltdown by any stretch of the imagination, but for Jeter, it was. I guess there's a first time for everything. In retrospect, I'm actually not sure why Jeter would even do the interview. It was a no-win situation for him. He couldn't answer truthfully. The fans don't want to hear that the price of their season tickets is exactly the same as it was before they traded away their best four players, Stanton, Ozuna, Yelich, and Gordon. There'd be a revolt. It's obvious what's happening down there. They're streamlining the organization. It happens. They're pushing the reset button, and they're cleaning house, if you will. Don't think for a moment that Derek Jeter and the Marlins aren't going to attempt to rebuild in the image of the New York Yankees. What's happening in Miami right now is just the beginning. I'm not sure why people are so irritated at Jared Jeter. They should actually be excited about what's to come. He's going to attempt to build a franchise that has sustainable winning power.
I was the personal catcher for several pitchers during my 16-year major league career. I was happy for the regular playing time, but if I were a manager, I would not assign that duty to any catcher. Apparently, Aaron Boone agrees with me. Sonny Gray has struggled in the early going with Gary Sanchez behind the plate, but Boone won't assign Austin Romine the job of being Gray's personal catcher. We've seen many instances over the years of it working for a team's benefit, but here's the danger in it. Pitchers get so used to a certain catcher, their presence behind the plate becomes a crutch. In many instances, like the Yankees, the starting catcher is a key cog in the offensive wheel. Gary Sanchez is a huge presence in the Yankees lineup. When you remove Sanchez from the lineup, you weaken it. Flashbacks to the great Braves team of the 90s. Javi Lopez was the starting catcher and the number four hitter, the cleanup guy. They made the playoffs every year and predictably Greg Maddox would start game one of the series. Javi Lopez did not catch Greg Maddox, so their cleanup hitter was on the bench for the beginning of every postseason series for the better part of a decade. That makes no sense to me. The ultimate goal is to win the World Series. Ideally, you'd like to see the best team on the field as often as possible. But when you look at it the way I do, it actually presents itself as a bad idea in the grand scheme of things because you end up weakening a lineup at the worst possible moments for one guy's level of comfort. I understand that the batter gets four at-bats and that the pitcher might go nine. Well, who are we kidding? <laughs> Nobody goes nine anymore. So I guess I made my point again. Why weaken an entire team for five innings of work when a masher like Gary Sanchez gets four chances to go deep in a ball game? You Darvish has had trouble navigating through major league lineups twice in a game so far this season. Multiple times he's had trouble making it out of the fifth inning, and the Cubs are wondering why. I'm not. It's obvious to me. Darvish has great stuff and an array of weapons, but in my opinion, he makes poor choices. He's got too many toys in the toy box and seems to bore easily. One of the most important things a pitcher has going for him is the unknown. A little mystery, it goes a long way in a ball game. The more information you give a major league hitter, the more likely he is to get a hits against you. Teams who favor metrics suggest that allowing a pitcher to face a lineup three times increases the chance of success. Well, no kidding, captains of the obvious. Positions like these, they remind me why I'm not a stat geek. You can skew them however you like. To me, it's like saying, if you go swimming in the ocean three times, you increase your chances of drowning or being bitten by a shark. Are you going to stop swimming? Pitchers today, they know that teams are going to pull them after five or six innings, so they hold nothing back. They expose their entire repertoire to the opposing lineup in the first inning, sometimes to the first hitter. No wonder they're whacking them around the yard the second time through the batting order. My goal as a catcher when I was calling a ball game was to get through the entire lineup and only expose one of my off-speed pitches to them. That way, I establish the fastball command, I've gotten them in swing mode, and I've still maintained the mystery of my game plan. I still have something that they haven't seen in my back pocket to help me get through the lineup a second and maybe third time. Darvish is showing the opposition too much, too early, and that's why he struggles to get out of the fifth. Here's a look at his pitch breakdown. Four-seam fastball, 44.4%. Slider, 26.3%. Sinker, 11.9%. The cutter, 9.8%. The changeup, 4.3%. The curveball, 2.8%. And the splitter, 0.5%. Goodness gracious, he's throwing almost 50% off-speed stuff, and he's throwing all of them. He's struggling to make it out of the fifth with his great stuff? The numbers are obvious to me. Too much, too soon, and too often. The guy throws 95 and can bulkate both a two- and a four-seam fastball. It's time to simplify things, in my opinion. He should be more stingy. Pick an off-speed pitch, try to throw nothing but the fastball and an occasional slider or changeup first time through the order. If you want to throw slider to the righty, change up to the lefty, then fine. But stick to the plan. That way you have something to get them out with the second and third time if you get a chance to face them. Cubs shortstop Javier Baez is a hell of a player, but he needs to grow up. For my sake, I hope he continues to behave like a baby so I have stuff to talk about. My go-to guy, Yasiel Puig, is so much more well-behaved now, and it's robbing me of my weekly roast. Baez is a non-stop spectacle. It's like watching an episode of Honey Boo Boo. It's really quite comical. In a recent game against the Rockies in Colorado, Baez decided that DJ LeMahieu was relaying signs to his Rocky teammates from second base. His response, child is at best. 
He decided to stand in front of LeMahieu to obscure his view of the home plate area and then run back to his shortstop position, once again focusing the attention on himself. A debate ensued and umpires Vic Carapazza and Greg Gibson had to intervene. Now, sign stealing is as old as the game. Generations of baseball players have debated whether or not it's an acceptable practice. I say, if you're too stupid to employ sophisticated signs at the big league level, then you get what you deserve. I'm going to steal your signs and relay them to my teammates all day long. It's not my fault you're lazy and stupid, and it's certainly not my fault that you weren't taught to be a big leaguer before you got there. If you don't want people to steal your signs, get tougher signs. If you think it's rude, then handle yourself accordingly. Knock somebody down. Make them understand what happens when you get caught stealing signs. A fastball in the ribs stopped a lot of guys from doing a lot of things on major league fields over the years. All these things, they can be done quietly and without fanfare. There's no need to run around like a chicken with your bleach blonde head cut off, flapping your arms in the air, hollering, look at me, look at me. As I said, selfishly, I hope Javier Baez continues to misbehave. His warning track, fly ball, bat flips, and all that accompanies the Baez show gives me something to mock and roast. I smell something cooking. Stay tuned, gang. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date with our weekly, our live, and our Sunday roast programs here at Manalist TV.